Welcome to the 20 Minute Topic, I'm Marcus Stead and joining me once again is veteran campaigner and blogger Greg Lance Watkins. This week's topic is shaping the economy and equipping young people for the future. It's a big topic and 20 minutes is not a long time so let's crack straight on. Greg, we had some interesting feedback to last week's podcast where we touched upon how the upcoming and unrolling 5G revolution is going to mean that in the future it won't just be the clothes factories and the electronics factories that are moving labour to the Far East to drive down wages, but highly skilled jobs will go the same way. And it sounds to me as though this is going to render the minimum wage obsolete, isn't it? Well, much of unemployment nowadays is due to people not being prepared to work for minimum wages hmm. uh, because minimum wages aren't, just aren't um, sustainable for the calibre of work they're producing. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, net result, they're, they're selecting unemployment by demanding minimum wages. Yes, and also the creation of jobs in this country is becoming more and more complicated. The actual process of employing people, because now you have to offer a workplace pension, and obviously the minimum wages you've just touched on this also increase maternity and paternity rights. Now, it does seem to me as though the big corporations aren't too bothered about this because they can absorb the costs, but what it also does is it knocks out small and medium-sized businesses who don't have the resources or the budgets to absorb those costs. So this is a difference, I think, between capitalism and corporatism. Corporatism, high regulation is supported by multinationals for that reason. It knocks out the little guys. But that's not really what capitalism is about. This is corporatism, is it not? I think this is total inability to cope with not to cope with change, mm. business can cope with change. What it cannot cope with is uncertainty mm. and speed of change. Mm. And I don't think corporatism and capitalism and um, any of these are anything other than ways of desperately trying to protect what they're doing mm. at all levels. Mm. And what it is doing is driving British jobs abroad. Yes. And it's driving them abroad wholesale. Hmm. Uh, we are losing jobs at a horrendous rate hmm. because we are pricing ourselves out of the market. The, the basic point I think we're agreed on on this is that we are already familiar with how the unskilled jobs, um, the, the cheap clothes, the T-shirt I'm wearing now, dare I say, was produced somewhere in the Far East. Um, the 5G revolution, which is now well underway and will really start to play out this next five to ten years, will see even the most skilled jobs not only in some cases completely disappear because of the technology, but even when human presence is required... It'll be done on a global basis where your physical location will not matter. And that will be handy in some ways for the consumer, but it will also see the drive down of wages. And that seems inevitable, I think. Um, the final point I want to make on this is it brings me on to the issue of productivity. Now, the most up-to-date productivity um, figures for the UK say that productivity was down 0.1% in the final quarter of last year. Um, there are some conventional theories on this um, doing rounds. The, the, thing, the things we always hear, companies have invested too little in technology, um, low borrowing rates have created so-called zombie companies that under normal circumstances when borrowing rates were at a norm, they would go under. Um, businesses have held on to unproductive workers rather than investing in that technology. Um, but I think there's another factor here. And there was a, a BBC documentary about ooh, five years ago now, perhaps, called Make Me a German, where Justin Rowlett, um, the BBC journalist, and his wife, B. Rowlett, had to go and live in Germany for, I think it was about a month, with their young children and live as German a lifestyle as possible. And this was from everything from the supermarkets they shopped in, the cars they drove and everything. The reason I'm mentioning that is because they went into the workplace. He worked in a, a pencil factory 
and um, then we saw how that worked and then they invited some neighbours round to dinner and he, when he was in the pencil factory and when they were discussing things with um, their friends around the dinner table one of the things that became clear is that when you're in Germany you go to work to work um, small talk is frowned upon, um, being seen on your phone when you should be on the factory floor or the office floor is frowned upon. And the neighbours said um, that when one, one of them went to work in a British office for a month connected to the business they work in in Germany, they were shocked by how much of the working day they, the British workers spent discussing their personal lives and what was on TV last night. And that, is, that I think, is in no small part contributing to our productivity problem. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> let's, lo let's look at the British worker. We have the major problem at the moment that we have organisations and political parties that are doing everything in their power to stand in the way of um, the democratic need for change. Mm. Um, abusing their... the responsibility that was put in their hands, abusing the promises that they have made to the electorate um, in order, like Luddites, to prevent the change that is absolutely inevitable. Unfortunately, it's coming from um, a what about the workers basis, uh, which makes a mockery of the term worker. Mm. And we have um, the indecision um, of Brexit at the moment, uh, which is, um, in my opinion, a very sound opportunity to be grabbed and taken advantage of, yet it is being completely squandered by efforts to destroy it that are going to eventually lead to Brexit uh, being a position that um, becomes near untenable uh, as they will have so harmed the image as to have made it untenable, having overlooked the fact that to remain will possibly lead to open strife on, in our country. And this is just standing in the way of change. Mm. And it's about as futile as standing in the way of the intercity 125 as it rumbles down the railway line. Mm. You will get flattened. Mm. Unfortunately, by stalling on Brexit, we are going to end up delaying all sorts of um, industrial moves that are essential, one of which is close down our steelworks, because to run them on a subsidy is just to have a dole queue producing something that nobody wants. Is there not an argument, though, in terms of national security for having a steady domestic supply of steel? Uh, tell me what's made of steel that you use... Uh, exclusively for warfare or um, need for warfare. Um, don't tell me tanks um, because a tank is a pretty useless piece of equipment in modern warfare. Don't tell me aircraft carriers because that really is useless since we've invented um, the entire Navy is useless since we invented the heat homing missile a friend of mine who's a lot older than me, who's not far off your age, um, was a, as a defence correspondent in the early 1980s and he was told by somebody very senior in the British military round about the time of the Falkland War that this would be the last time aircraft carriers would be used and they, they were about 10, 20 years away from them becoming obsolete. Oh, I think he was right. Mm. It was 30 years ago to the Falkland War, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> And I think they're totally obsolete, um, despite the fact that we've two, built two superb museum pieces. Mm. Um, they're such museum pieces that they are floating around um, 
running into the odd thing and offering um, free taxi rides for uh, the captains Mm. um, and um, unarmed um, because we haven't got any aeroplanes to land on them. Mm. I think we should end this podcast by trying to give some good advice, not just to the very young, but also people about my age who are going to be in the workplace for the next 30 years. Today's young people now, going to university to study what exactly and what will be the reward at the end of it? Because I know people, I came out of university 14 years ago, almost to the day actually, and um, I know a number of people of my age who are not just on my course but studied other things who have since had to completely retrain because what they learned less than 15 years ago is already obsolete. We're going to see not just the steel worker, the coal miner, and so on and so forth, the, the old industrial place, disappear completely in terms of manpower, but we're going to see the professions go the same way for reasons we've already touched on with regards to 5G technology, how that's going to influence medicine. We're already seeing the legal profession not being as lucrative as it used to be. What advice can we give young people as to what they should do with their lives and how they should plan their futures if they're in their teens, their 20s or even their 30s? I think the most important thing is remain light-footed so that you can make changes rapidly. Mm. Um, Yes, there will always be a call for um, people uh, who are specialists in their field. Um, the preeminent 10% in any given doctrine uh, at university will always find you that education will serve them well. Um, however, for the person who just scrapes through, uh, I think a good course in bricklaying would probably have served them better. Um, and don't expect a job to last you more than four four or five years at mm. most mm. Um, because uh, if you're in a skilled job or profession um, such as computer technology such as um, engineering such as architecture such as medicine such as teaching Um, All jobs that require a great deal of training, by the time you've been doing it five years, you have such skill wastage that the people who are now qualifying will be better skilled than you are. Mm -hmm. And they will displace you. Simple as that, because they will come out of university with their up-to-the-minute qualification, and they will be better at the job than you are. So what you're saying is be prepared to retrain and even go in completely different directions, not just once in your career, but potentially every five to ten years. Yes, very much so. And be prepared to move um, on an international basis, take advantage of the reputation that Britain has around the world and is in danger of squandering if people keep on standing in the way of Brexit. Um, where we must take the best deal we can, Uh, we must, of course, leave no deal on the table. Uh, Purely and simply, it is a bargaining chip, and it was utterly irresponsible of the MPs to take it off the table in their own personal self-interest. You cannot bargain with virtually both your hands tied behind your back it's hard to bargain with one hand tied behind your back and it's a bloody hard bargain to drive with all the weapons at your disposal Uh, people overlook the fact that um, nobody from choice would wish to have no deal uh, but the politicians are so incredibly ill-informed and stupid that they haven't realized that unless they get their act together, and I mean together, all sides in the parliament, without the posturing of one side against another, uh, we are going to find ourselves in the utterly balls-aching position of having to negotiate every single sale with a complex 
trade agreement. In other words, if we wish to sell a bag of carrots to the marketplaces around the world, we will have to draw up a bag of carrots deal. I think the message here, and this is a point I made on television last year, and I was thanked for making this point by a young entrepreneur immediately afterwards, and again when I bumped into us somewhere else by coincidence a few days later, I said that the business world can handle and adapt to bad news a lot better than it can handle uncertainty. And what we've had is three years now of dithering and uncertainty, and it is that that is damaging British business and British entrepreneurship and the economy as a whole far more than a bad Brexit deal would. Far, far more. Two things are crippling the British economy, particularly. The utter incompetence of our devious and dishonest politicians of all parties and persuasions mm. who are, would seem to be only interested in themselves. Mm. The complete and utter lunacy that underpins climate change, which is costing this country billions when for 600 million years, climate change has existed, driven, as I said earlier, by the sun, plate tectonics, and volcanic action on an earth that is marginally cooling at a rate we can't even read as it shrinks. These are all completely beyond the ability of man to make any change. And we are hampering ourselves with obscenely high taxes, the most expensive bill ever passed by the British government is the climate change bill. Mm. It will bankrupt us. Mm. And that is an arguable fact. It doesn't matter how many scientists you line up to prove that's not true. They're just the same scientists who for 20 or 30 years promised on a stack of Bibles backed by doctors that smoking was good for you. <laughs> yeah, and that was it's right up the until same the 1950s. bloody people yeah. mm. who are concerned about keeping their laboratories going and you can only get your laboratory funded by people with a financial interest, mm. the producers of wind turbines, the producers of solar panels, both of which cannot be recycled, mm. both of which require massive resources to make. It will take between 15 and 20 years of optimum production uh, output by a wind turbine to replace the energy it costs to make a wind turbine. Mm. Mm. What is the point? It's not green energy, it's obscene energy. And producing electric motor cars is a game for idiots. You've got to make the electricity. Whether you make the electricity pollution with a petrol engine, which of course can be immensely cleaned up or whether you make the electricity with the pollution of a power station or the obscene level of pollution of solar panels and wind turbines you are polluting the planet you're not making a blind bit of difference to climate change mark you whatever you do mm. Mm. And I, I, I agree with what you're saying on that because I've read Christopher Booker's work on the subject and um, his book, The Real Global Warming Disaster, goes into the, the myth of the man-made climate change theory in a huge amount of depth. And it, it's, it's all in there. So to sum up then, your message to young people is be flexible, be prepared to retrain a number of times in your career and where possible, be prepared to travel internationally. Um, indeed, in fact, be prepared to travel, whether it's internationally hmm. or um, within your, this country or coming not very far away 
we will be travelling beyond this planet. Plenty to think about there. My thanks to Greg as always. Join us next week when we've got a very different but equally intriguing topic up for discussion. Thanks for listening. See you next week.